All right. Well, good morning from Nashville, Tennessee this morning. I'm excited about this topic. This has been a, a series that we've been doing now for uh, over two years, the Mobilizing People of Color web series. Uh, this will be part two uh, for the Mobilizing Latin American series. If you didn't catch uh, episode one uh, with David Ruiz of Avant, I highly recommend you go to our YouTube channel and check that out. He did a fantastic job of laying out some uh, foundational missions history of the Latin American people, uh, and it was just fantastic. Uh, and when we started to think about what uh, we wanted to do for episode two, uh, I really wanted to get a pastor's perspective. Um, you know, we're all a part of the body of Christ, and uh, pastors have a unique perspective uh, to the successes and also the challenges. Um, and Marco was the first person that came to mind. Uh, I got the chance to work with Marco uh, for many years. We both worked at Perspectives. Uh, I was the Texas Regional Director. Marco and his family lived here in Texas, and we worked together a lot, collaborated together a lot, and we even co-ran a summer intensive in Dallas with 50 American pastors and 50 uh, Spanish-speaking pastors from all over the world. Uh, it was an incredible week with his team and our team in Texas, uh, and that was a lot of a lot of fun. So uh, I'm excited. Uh, Marco is a pastor uh, at the Heights Espanol in Richardson, Texas, just outside of Dallas. And so, Marco, I am so glad that you're here today uh, to join us. Uh, if you haven't been on a webinar with us before, uh, Marco is going to uh, present his materials and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. This is your opportunity to engage on the topic and with the presenter. Um, you can find that in the question um, and answer portion of the control panel. So as things come to mind, as Marco is speaking and sharing, uh, please feel free to type in those questions and we'll get to as many as we can uh, for the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, your uh, cameras are off and your microphones have been muted just to preserve sound and video quality, um, but we will give you an opportunity to engage later. After this webinar is completed, about a week later, we will release this on our YouTube channel. You can find our, uh, uh, you can find hundreds of webinars that we've done before um, at www.youtube.com slash 1615, all spelled out. Uh, please feel free to subscribe to the channel so you know when we uh, release new videos. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marco. Marco, feel free to jump on your camera there. Um, really excited that you're here, brother. Thanks for taking time out to uh, to share with us today. Well, thank you, David. Uh, my pleasure to to share with you guys, I would like to, I'm gonna wait for a little bit to see the presentation on the screen, but yeah, my name is Marco Murillo, as David said, I I had the pleasure, the, the honor to be serving in the Latino church here in, in the US, I'm from Mexico, Mexico City, and I came with my family to the US in 2010, just to pursue some theological studies, my wife to take, a, furlough from from the mission field she's from michigan i met her in mexico we we had two kids in mexico and then when we moved to texas the lord gave us the third kid uh, so she is a texan mexican and the other kids are mexican american so they they do have this dual nationality but i'm gonna wait for the presentation to be in the screen but i would like to share with you the perspective from the pastoral uh, mobilization. I had the privilege to be in the ministry for 23 years now. I came to Christ when I was 18. And then from Mexico City, I had the privilege to go to Argentina and do some uh, seminary students stud studies there. Sorry, I'm trying to move this presentation. So uh went to argentina and then went back to mexico city where i met my wife and i've been in the ministry for 23 years pastoring in argentina pastoring in mexico in texas in georgia 
And now we're back in Texas, uh, mobilizing, trying to lead the Latino church. I'm gonna share with you uh, five points. I'm, I would like to start talking about the challenge of the Hispanic church in the US. The challenge mm -hmm. will be the balanced growth. Uh, the second point will be the Hispanic population. Let me just give you a couple numbers just to have it in mind because we are the second largest uh, Spanish speaking country in the world, just right behind Mexico, who has like 130 million and happened that in the US we are more than 60 million now. The third point will be the biblical mandate. We, we are in trouble because we're not obeying what the Lord has been said and commanded us. So let me explore with you in five minutes, just the biblical mandate and how the Latino church has a role. And more point will be, I would like to share with you some service that I run locally with some pastors in the area, just to, to have a better, a better view of the, the challenge, the problems we're facing here locally in the north part of Dallas, Texas. And let me finish with some proposal to you. I would like to propose something which is gonna be the the mobilization of the Latino church, and that's gonna be starting from national mission trips, national short-term mission trip. So let me let me start with with this the, the challenge that the Hispanic church and pretty I'm pretty sure all churches in the world has this same challenge, but I'm seeing that many churches are just working in growth with numbers, right? Right here. The challenge is to to grow but but in a balance, in a balanced way, not just in number. It's so easy if you're a pastor or you're a leader, it's so easy to fill the pews, or you could be very tempted to fill the pews by preaching the prosperity gospel, just to preach whatever the people are looking uh, to hear, just to fill them, to make them feel good, like you're a champion, you, you, you can have what you want as long as you're having faith. I mean, growth in number is a challenge, but let me repeat myself, yes, it could be pretty easy to grow your church just by preaching whatever, right? So it's not about to fill the pews, although we, we have this challenge, we want to see more people coming to, to Christ, but the challenge of growing in number, uh, it could be pretty, uh, it could be fulfilled pretty easy, just not preaching the Bible, just do prosperity gospel. And I'm seeing a lot of people, a lot of churches struggling with that. So the temptation is just to start preaching whatever, just to make the people feel comfortable. And we know that's not that's not the goal, right? But the the challenge to, to grow the church is not just in numbers. You gotta be preaching the Bible. So you gotta be growing in quality. And by quality, what I mean is is obedience uh, the lord has been has been giving us commands to obey he expects from us to be his disciples and if it's not, there's not obedience well you're not a disciple if you're not doing what the lord has commanded you uh, you're not a follower i mean to be a disciple you have to obey in in the new testament we're going to see that when the Lord is given the great commission is, is telling us to go and teach all that he has commanded us, all the Jesus's commands, right? Gotta be the first thing that we teaching to our disciples and not just uh, as a mere information, but something that people has to obey. You'll see more than 50 commands, Jesus's commands or the apostle commands in the New Testament. What we do here in the church is just uh, narrow to 12, 12 commands, which are like uh, be baptized, like participate in the communion. You got to be giving, right? And offerings. You got to go and share the gospel with other people. So the challenge is to grow the church, knowing pews or 
people in pews, but those people to 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 go and obey, to to do whatever Jesus is commanding us. So that's the challenge. Not only people in the pews, but people who is obeying those commands. The third thing that is another challenge to grow the church is the outreach. So we gotta go and reach people with the gospel. We gotta be sharing the gospel uh, to every everywhere, every place, right? We need to go even, uh, we need to share the gospel even in English, even if it's broken, because we're not commanded to only reach the Latinos or uh, there's some fantasy of this uh, bad idea of the Latino church that you only have to reach the Latinos because you speak Spanish. And no, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that we need to go and reach as many as possible. So for the Latino church in the U.S., it's a challenge to go and reach all the people and to be able to reach other people here in the U.S. is got to be through the English. Even if it's broken, even if you are so limited, like myself, I'm pretty limited in my English. But I had to preach. I had to be there. I had to learn the basic vocabulary and to be reaching out other people with the gospel. So that will be the first challenge. The first point that I would like to share with you as a Latino church in the U.S., we got to grow in number, we got to grow in quality, and we got to grow in outreach. And all that has to be, if it's possible, at the same time. Many pastors, many people are going to be waiting just to be a good number and then to start teaching them uh, the conditions of man's. And then when they are a good number and they are mature or they are growing, uh, they, they're going to go and reach other people. The, the challenge is not to wait, not to wait. If you're five, you're 10, you're 40, just start by obeying. And the way you're going to be growing as a disciple is just to go to obey and go to obey by sharing the gospel. So you don't have to wait too much. I would like to propose you uh, to grow in, in the three aspects at the same time as much as possible. So let me jump into the second part of uh, this presentation. I'm sorry, it's, it's jumping pretty, pretty weird. Okay, so the Hispanic population in the U.S. I, I mentioned before that we are the second largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. Uh, just right behind Mexico with 130 million, but it's estimated here in the U.S. 62.5 million of Spanish speakers uh, that has been growing. I mean, this statistics is is very stable. That's uh, showing us from 1970 to 2021. And if you do the math, you'll see that we have been growing a million per year. So when we came in the 2010, right here, we, we have grown 12 million. In 12 years that I've been here in the US, uh, we can see that we have been growing exponentially. I mean, it's, it's, it's not only people coming to the US, but it's also second, third, fourth generations. You'll see all those people, four generations here in Texas. Some people are gonna be in California, New Mexico, in all those places. It's very interesting because we live in the south part of Texas for four years and the, the Hispanic population there is, is 90%, 90%. You can you don't have to speak English. I mean, you, you're just gonna be speaking Spanglish and you're gonna survive in South Texas. Pretty much in California happened the same thing in Miami. Uh, if you're looking for a job in Miami, you had to speak Spanish just to be hired. So it's very interesting what's happening in the U.S. People, more and more people are coming. More and more and more people are staying here and having babies. So by 2050, it is expected to be uh, for the Hispanic population just to be the one quarter of the U.S. population. Let me show you this. Uh, what is those? What are those Latinos? You know, I'm from Mexico, and and people that there are no Latinos are thinking, okay, so 
all the Latinos ate tacos, and that is not true. No, all Latinos ate tacos. No, all Latinos are brown. You're going to see pretty blonde people who speak Spanish, especially if they are coming from Argentina, from Uruguay, from Spain. So no, all the Latinos ate tacos. No, all the Latinos like the whole sauce. No, all the Latinos are with the same background. You'll see that, especially in the church, when you're having people from 13 countries, 15 countries, 16 countries, you'll see all the differences. You have to deal with not only different in cultural aspects like food or or language. You know, I've been I've been preaching in some churches, and happened that one word that we use a lot in Mexico, uh, it could be offensive for people in for people from Puerto Rico, right? If I said a word in Spanish that means anything or just a simple thing in my country. For other countries, other cultures could be very offensive. So we got a lot of fun. We got a lot of fun in churches here in the U.S. because you'll see people from different nationalities gather, gather together. But not only that, you have to deal with differences in, in religion, differences in, in worldviews, right? So you'll see that Puerto Rican, Cuba, and Dominicans they're gonna have they're gonna have a different aspect of the religion, and mainly because uh, they had to deal with santeria, which is more like a, a kind of a witchcraft, and they're gonna be dealing with hechiceria, uh, uh, you know, witchcraft. I'll just say it in English and Spanish, but you see that from the Caribbean, you see a differences be, uh, on the Peruvians or the South American part. And even Mexico, Mexico is so different. Mexico, we got a lot of regions in Mexico. So you have to keep this in mind because the Hispanic church, the Hispanic population, we're not the same. We're not all brown. We're not everybody eating tacos. So keep that in mind because uh, it's very important to reach them out. Now, another thing that the Hispanic population in the U.S. have uh, as a challenge as well, is the on how to write immigrants or undocumented or some people say illegal people. It is interesting because if you see the, the numbers here, it is estimated that in 2017, only 10 million were undocumented, only 10 million. That makes pr pr pretty much like the 18%, probably 20% of those that uh, we live here in the U.S., they don't have documents. And this is important because sometimes uh, in the Anglo church, the African-American church, the, what they're thinking about the Hispanics is, you all ate tacos, you all are from Mexico, you all are brown, and you all are illegal or undocumented. And that is not truth. Right, that is not true. No, from Mexico, we're not all brown. We're not all undocumented. Again, people in Texas happen that one day they wake up and they realize we're not Mexico any, anymore. We are now Texas, or we are now U.S. People in California. So that's why you see a lot of generations of Hispanics uh, living in the U.S. So it's just a small percentage of people who has not documents to be freely to, to travel and to go places. So just keep that in mind because uh, what I'm going to propose you is uh, it is important to, to have this in mind. Another thing that I would like to show you is the I'm a Southern Baptist and the numbers that, that, that I have is uh, from the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm pretty sure there's more churches. The Assemblies of God and the Pentecostal Church has been growing. Well, let me show you from, from my perspective, from my network, from the numbers that I do have, the Hispanic churches, SBC Hispanic churches in the U.S., it is estimated that we have 3,361 churches that speak Spanish, right? Or they are led by Hispanics. Uh, that makes one, one Southern Baptist church for 18 
0.5 thousand Hispanics in the US. If you add the Assemblies of God, you add the Pentecostals, that's probably, if we put the numbers like equal, equal numbers, that's still, uh, that's still making a lot of need of churches who speak Spanish just to reach out these 60 million of Hispanic population in the US. So if we if we put together the SBC, the Assembly of God in the Pentecostal church that are the, the, the biggest churches in the world and also in the US, that is gonna that's gonna make one church for every six thousand Hispanics. Uh, and that's interesting because we need more churches. We need to start planting more and more churches. And again, one problem, there's a lot of prosperity gospel. You'll see churches that they're huge. They have thousands of people coming to their services. But the problem is they're not looking to grow in quality. Uh, I don't think they are worried for those people if they are believers or not. Because of prosperity gospel, they're only looking for numbers, for money, for uh, come and be healed, come and, 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 and hear that you're a champion, that you can do everything. And not necessarily our churches, it could be, it could be Baptist churches, it could be Pentecostal or whatever. But if they are preaching not the gospel, if they are preaching the prosperity gospel, which is a lie, that's uh, obviously we, we're not going to see churches being mobilized. We're not going to see churches growing in quality. Those, those churches are not asking people to, to obey Jesus' commands or to go and make disciples to other places. So what we need here is, is healthy churches those churches who are uh, preaching the gospel, they are uh, welcoming everybody by preaching the gospel and, and asking them to grow, to be disciples. And if they are disciples, they well need to go. They need to be mobilized. Just keep that in mind again, because uh, it's a good challenge. Uh, let's go to the third point which is the biblical mandate. I'm not going to spend too much time here because it's obvious if you are in this uh, podcast is because you are a believer and you know these Bible verses. But let me remind you this. The biblical mandate to go and make disciple is also for the Hispanic church. It's for everybody. The problem is that for many years, the Hispanic church has seen themselves like the mission field, right? Like I'm poor, I'm uneducated, or I am just came to Christ the, the last year. So I'm the mission field still, come and help me. But we don't think it's, it's that a, 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 a right way of thinking about ourselves. In 1987, 84, a group of people, a group of missionaries, uh, mobilizers, missionaries, leaders, pastors, they get together in a country and then uh, they came out with this idea that we're not a mission field. It, more than an idea, it was a declaration. We're not a mission field, but a mission force. We're here to go and make disciples. So let's stop seeing ourselves as the mission field. Let's put our pants like the adult person and then just go and make disciples because that is there in Matthew 28 for all the disciples. Hey, you got to go and make disciples to all nations. The interesting part that we can see as a strategy is in the book of Acts, right? When, when is Jesus himself saying, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in, in all Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest pa parts of the earth. So let me propose this as a strategy, or at least we are using it here in the, at the Heights. Uh, we got to go and reach out our city, right? Or Jerusalem. And then we got to go to the Judea, which is a region, probably our state. Here in Texas, uh, you got a lot of land to cover. You, you have to make 12 hours from south to north and to east to west just to be able to be out of Texas, right? But that could be our, our Judea. Another part of this uh, command is to go to Samaria. 
not necessarily is to go to other regions, but to go to other peoples, peoples here in the same city, in the same region, that they probably speak different than us. They have a different religion, they have a different culture, but we got to go and reach them out. And of course, going to the remotest parts of the earth, going to the end of the world, to the unreached people groups, that's the command that we should to obey. Now, let me show you a couple uh, surveys that I run probably six months ago between our different friends, different churches. It is a survey that I run to 40 Hispanic churches or pastors, 40 SBC pastors that we work together here in the same region, in the same state. And then later, I'm going to show you another survey that I had run in church, in a local church, just to just to understand a little bit what could it be, because it's pretty clear. We got to go and make disciples, right? We're 60 million. We're, we are a mission force. There's a lot of need. We need to plant a lot of churches, and then we need to go and reach other peoples. But let's evaluate where we are, what we're thinking, and that this service is going to it's going to give us some ideas. So uh, 47 of those 40 another churches, SBC churches here in our region in Texas, they were older than 10 years old. By means is they've been working for 15, maybe 20 years, uh, reaching out people here in the state, only less than about 3%, <clears throat> excuse me, 3% has been active for less than three years. 77% in an urban context and 20, 23% on rural, rural context, by means uh, where less population is, is there, right? So the, the answers is, I'm gonna go pretty quick because it's, I don't have to spend too much time, but in the attendance, uh, 36% of most of them, there were less than 50 people attending every Sunday, and 26%, it was in the average, the national average of attendance will be into 50, between 50 or 80 people, and only 10% uh, gathered together more than 300 people uh, every Sunday. This is important because uh, as, as the number of people are uh, gathering together will be the, the strength of the church, right? Uh, in people, in resources, and in strategies that you need to be following. Again, we need to grow in number, we need to grow in quality, and we need to grow in outreach. So there's going to be different churches in different contexts, but these are the people who answer service. So the first question, I'm not going to be showing you everything, but the first question is, is this, my church has the responsibility to reach other cities in the same country with the gospel. And obviously, because we are good Southern Baptists, we say, yes, 90% agree with that. We need to go and reach other cities in the same country with the gospel by means national mission trips. So if you agree with that, well, let me, let me ask you this. My church has the knowledge to do short-term national mission trips. And then 57%, most of the, the majority, they were agreed with this. But yeah, we know. We know what to do, right? Because we are good Christians. Only 23% disagree that, well, no, to be honest, we don't know. But this is the shocking thing because, yes, we know what is in the Bible. We know how to do it. But what is our experience? Our experience in national mission trips in the, in the last five years, it, the 43% says none. We haven't had any mission trip uh, more than our region, more than our Jerusalem. We, we haven't go to other places. It's none experience. 20% is going to say, well, some, one or two trips. Remember, this is, these are five years. And the mass of the better, they have some regular three trips, making a trip and a half, uh, one trip in every uh, one and a half year. So 
is not is not too uh encouraging what well, what we're seeing we know the bible but we're not obeying the bible of the desire to make national mission trips 83 percent were agree like yes we would like to do it the problem is we we probably don't know what to do or we haven't had the opportunity or we haven't been exposed we probably just working in numbers to growth of church or probably we just teaching the bible and when the people understand they're gonna go by themselves but again the the propose is not to growth one part of the time but to growth in a balanced way to grow in number quality and as you're growing in those numbers in, and in that quality just go go to obey uh so that's a big challenge let me share with you briefly our local church context and let me be clear it's not because we're an example of, of course we're not just uh it's an honest uh way of thinking about ourselves all right so a local church is an urban church we are in the middle of the city uh major highways right here uh has been here around for 30 years and we are a group of 170 in attendance i mean we're growing uh, last sunday we had more than this but you know after covid everybody is like trying to reach out and try to be in the the numbers again but that's a local church and that's are the questions that we ask here we ask our people those 170 people uh what do you think my church has the responsibility to reach other cities in the same country with the gospel 78 percent said agree they said amen pastor they say yes we have this responsibility all right so let's see uh what else my church has the knowledge to do short-term national mission trips again all beautiful people said amen 62 percent agree uh 22 percent disagree they say no we're not ready we don't have the knowledge we need to prepare better and more but at least i know where the people in our church are or desire to make national mission trips I, again 83 percent said i'm agree i'm on it i would like to go 17 percent on the side they don't know um for many reasons and this is this is interesting because I know the church is is knowing that they gotta go and make disciples. They have they have the desire to go. Now let me ask you, what could it be the biggest obstacle? Because we're not doing it, right? So what could it be the biggest obstacle for you to attend a mission trip if we're planning to do it to go into another city uh, here in the U.S.? Well, forty six percent they answer. You know what? uh time i don't have time i work and i work a lot and that is truth i'll tell you something the hispanic church has to work sometimes double or triple to be able to send their kids to school to pay for the college to do just a normal living and i i know 40 percent, 46 percent of our people they're willing they know but they're not going to be able because uh, they had to work. 26% they're going to say, well, the finances. I am barely making month by month, right? So that's a problem. I would like to go, but I don't have the money to do it. And interesting, because 11%, they said, well, I do not have the legal documents to travel. I do not have the freedom to go wherever I want. And that was interesting because, again, only 18% of the total Hispanic population, they don't have documents to, to travel freely. Although I always talk to, to our congregation like, hey guys, if you don't have documents, uh, it doesn't mean you cannot go. Uh, you can go, the problem, the problem will be that you cannot come back, right? But, but don't, 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 don't cheat i mean don't don't lie to yourself you you can go and make disciples even to other nations 
uh, probably you're not going to be able to come back, but that's another story. But again, thinking in national mission trips, these are the most of the biggest uh, obstacles uh, that our church, locally church, is facing. Now, let me give you this proposal. Let me let me give you a challenge. Let's do national mission trips. Church, you're not a mission. You're not a mission field. You're a mission force. Let's go and obey. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're 100, we're 20, we are 500, we are 1,000 people. We got to grow in our outreach. You've been growing in numbers, growing in quality. Do you know what to do? You're convinced you have this desire to do it. Well, let's do it. Let's go. Let's go to make disciples. Uh, and let's start nationally. Happened that the US, we are a nation for many colors. We're a nation of all peoples. I had the privilege to live in, in cities like Atlanta, Georgia. And you're gonna go to a place that is called Clarkston, Clarkston in Georgia. Happened that that is the, the most diverse square mile in the world. You're gonna go there and one square mile, you're gonna find 100 or probably 200 people groups. I call that place the missionary buffet. You wanna go and find some Muslims right there. You're gonna find, you're gonna go and preach some Buddhists, gonna find them in Craxton. You're gonna go and preach some Hindu, some, some uh, nationalities, some languages. You're gonna go there and you're gonna find them. It's interesting because you can walk in those places between those apartments. You see, uh, for the first time, those apartments, and it's, it's a regular apartment complex, US apartment complex. Like, it looks pretty. But as you are walking there, knocking the doors and talking to people, you, you're going to smell different kind of foods, spices. You're going to see different uh, accents, different languages, different people. So you don't have to go overseas to go and reach out the unrich people groups. You know, unrich people groups are here in the US. Most of the refugees, most of the rich refugees are resettling in Texas, in California, New York. Uh, there are people, I mean, we, we got a lot of Afghans here in Richardson, Texas. There are a lot of Muslims right in front of my house. You, and every Sunday you'll see people from a uh, lot of, lot of uh, uh, mosques there they're just cooking they're having a good time and church it's it's a privilege to go and reach them out let's go and reach them out they are here uh the u.s is a unique country where all the immigration is happening we have this as a value so so let's go let's get out of our comfort zone why missional uh national mission trips uh pastor can we do this in our city inner uh surroundings i bet that we can i mean yes let's go and reach out the afghans but let me propose to go to other cities out of our comfort zone I'll tell you why because hispanics we we gotta work a lot so it'll be good if you can separate you can spend just one week let's go to new jersey for one week, do all that is possible in your job, ask for permission, or I don't know, just let's go to New Jersey. Let's spend five days. Why? Why in New Jersey, Pastor and all here? Well, because in New Jersey, you'll be you'll be 100% focused in those people in that time. When you are here in your own city, you gotta go back to your house, and then they're gonna call you from work, and then you gotta be tempted not to go to, to the outreach, but to go to work. And there's a lot of distractions. When you go for a short mission trip, even nationally, to go to other places, you're gonna be 100% in out of your comfort zone, in the community, and then you're gonna be 100% thinking in the outreach, 100% 
praying for those people. So let's go and do that nationally. If Hispanic ask for permission, you don't have the documents to travel. Let me tell you why. Nothing, nothing can stop you from traveling. Pretty much of those ideas are just in people's minds. Like, no, I cannot because if the police stop me, oh, no, because, no, let me tell you, if the, you know, border patrol, whatever, catch you and they send you back to, I don't know, to your country or to another place, guess what? Be a missionary there. So, uh, and that's funny because people are like, oh, pastor, but you don't know that I'm fulfilling my, my American dream. I'll, I'll tell them, no, it's not about the American dream. It's about the kingdom. And now you're a disciple. So go and make disciples, whatever you are. So, uh, but again, go and make uh, national mission trips. My suggestions, let me give you in a couple minutes what I do recommend as a pastor. Again, I used to work as a mobilizer, going to church to church, to city to city, or even to countries. But now that I'm here every Sunday, I have the opportunity to speak and to mobilize my local church. I'm going to suggest you to preach the Bible, to preach the Missio Day from the pulpit every Sunday. You know that out of uh, 1,189 chapters on the Bible, the, the whole Bible is talking about the Missio Day. From Genesis to Revelation is about God's glory. And the gospel is also in 1,187 chapters of the Bible. So the whole Bible is, is talking about the gospel. It's talking about Jesus. So take the time to mobilize your church from the pulpit every Sunday. Every Sunday, you got to be uh, inspiring your people. You got to be uh, letting them know that it's a big need for Jesus to be preached. Preach the Bible and, that, and then the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to use the Bible. He's going to use the scripture to mobilize his people. Trust me. If you are preaching God's words, not yours, not telling them to the people that they are cute, they are champions, and they can have a dream, and if they believe it, it is going to become true. No, stop, stop preaching that if you're doing it, but preach the Bible. As much as you preach the Bible, the Holy Spirit is going to use that to mobilize his people. So the true believers are going to be mobilized just by hearing the Bible every Sunday, talking about God's glory, talking about the gospel, talking about Jesus, looking for the people. Jesus as the, the solo Christus, right? Uh, the church right now, we're having this series of the five solas. And the five solas are all about the gospel. It's all about salvation. Uh, I'm sorry, I became a little bit passionate about this, but preach the Bible, do discipleship, do discipleship one-on-one, -on -one. take people, take them to go and preach the gospel, use tools, use different tools to train their people, your people like perspectives, explore, no place left, etc. There's a lot of resources. Today we have podcasts, we have videos, we got uh, trainings, do that for your people disciple them teach them to obey and the fourth thing is i would like to suggest is just go just go plan do network uh take phones uh do some food sell the food go do the, do some uh car washes just go you gotta go you don't have the money well let's do some uh uh I can't think right now, but you know what I mean. Let's do fundraisers. Let's do crazy things. Go and have fun. Once you're there, eat with the people, uh, go to their houses and be inspired for them. So be 
a good disciple of Jesus. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, practice, practice, practice. Do a lot of practice. Go and preach the gospel. Go and gather people. Go and eat with the community. Do it uh, locally. So when it's time to go nationally, you are already doing whatever you're practicing here in the U.S. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop myself. I'm sorry I, I spent a little time. But David, what, what, we don't jump into the Q&A time, if you will. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marco. That was really great. Um, yeah, we got a bunch of questions, so I'm just going to jump in and feel free to to answer these. Um, someone asked, uh, I want to ask how we, all denominations and ethnic churches, can help to support and grow Hispanic leaders to lead Hispanic churches to grow the resources needed. Yes, that's a good question because it, it has to take more than my denomination. It has to take more than my church, right? To be able to fulfill the task is going to take us everybody. Uh, what we're doing now is uh, prayer meetings. If you can facilitate some network meetings starting by praying, that'll be awesome. I, I don't like too many meetings that they're just looking for me or for my people to go to their events. I try to, re uh, I don't like that, but when their other leadership asking me to come and pray, asking me and strategize, asking me and, and, and be part of something, uh, I'm on it, you know? So networking, start some networking movements locally, starting by praying. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I love this question because you began to, to touch on this a little bit in one of your um, slides. How can the Hispanic church in the U.S. help people unlearn the idea of the American dream and renounce that comfort so they can obey the Great Commission? Yes, David. Well, let, let, let me say this. The American dreams look different from the Latino uh it's different than the anglo okay the american dream i i like this david platt book radical and the american dream for from the anglo is to have the third house to have a boat to have a, you know uh vacations in whatever no for the latino pretty much the american dream is to have safety right is to have education is to have a house the first house and if it, if that is the American dream, I'm 100% for it, you know? We gotta be safe, we have to have education, we have to provide for our kids. So sometimes the American dream for the Latinos is misunderstood, thinking that is everything is bad, and I think that. I think that the Latino church has to be focused and uh, just to flourish, right? Just to be able to provide for their family. Uh, if that is the American dream uh, that the question the person is asking for, I'll say no. Let's let's empower the Latino church to to be there, right? But if it's about the second house, the boat, to to go and to do vacation in other places, let's just preach more Bible. I think that's the solution. Let's show the necessity. Let's show them that if God is uh, blessing you with that job with that little company small company let's just start giving more right yeah that's good that's good i like that um someone asked uh which resources in spanish would you recommend for helping lay people see the missio day throughout scripture i think i know one that you're going to mention but there may be others of course, the, the best tool that exists, that and, and I'm not saying this just lightly, is because I've been in the ministry for 22 years. I've been in a lot of uh, seminaries in different countries. The one that I feel, the, the one that I learn is the most effective is, is perspectives, perspectivas, all right? 
but I know, I know it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of stuff to, to be there. So another thing that I'm using at church is explore. Explore is like a perspectives condensed. It's, it's a pretty much, uh, it's a pretty less material. Perspectives, explore. You're gonna find uh, Mission Mundial, which is another good resource. It's three books, three, three, it's a, it's a series of three books. Mission Mundial, Perspectives, Explore. Even in Global is another uh, sources that uh, for churches that they want to have this strategic uh, mission trips and all that kind of stuff. We got a lot of resources uh, and I'll be glad to share in the, in the chat or something like that. Yeah, that's good. Good. Let's see. Um, looking through all these. You talked a bunch about national trips, and I think there were some that were that were both national, but someone specifically asked, what are your thoughts about international mission trips? Yes, well, uh, yes, of course, is there, right? The command is going to the ends of the earth. I'm, I'm trying to emphasize, emphasize the national trips as the starting point, right? Just getting out of the comfort zone, go to nationally, and then go internationally. Of course, I'm 100% about it. Uh, but let me tell you this, the Latino church or the Latino believers, pretty much when they're thinking in mission trip, they're thinking in their own country. So me as a Mexican, oh, let's go to my country because I do know a lot of need. Oh, let's go to Cuba, let's go to Honduras, let's go to, it's nothing wrong going there, okay? It's nothing wrong. But let me tell you this, the national church has grown a lot. So if you're going to Latin America in a mission trip, go to train the leadership, not to do the job, all right? Let, let, let me propose this. Don't go to, to preach the gospel. Well, that seems crazy because we got to be preaching the gospel. Yes, but you got to train the people to do the job because locals, they're going to do it much better than us going from, from the country, uh, from a different country. But go, go to the unreached people groups. I'll tell you something, this face, it's very familiar if I go to Morocco, if I go to Iraq, if I go to Iran, I go to those places, go to those places, take your people because the connection that we have with Middle East is huge. You, you're gonna be walking in Morocco and then you're gonna be thinking, oh, I'm in Mexico. <laughs> no, it's Morocco. It's just happened that we got a lot in common. Go to support the missionaries there. God is sending a lot of Latinos, a lot of Americans, a lot of Africans, a lot of Asians to those places. Go and be for them. Go and fix their car. Go and take care of their kids. Go and teach uh, self-defense, whatever. But go, if you're going to go internationally, go to those places. On rich people groups, you see the connection and you're going to be sending people like immediately because of the need. I love that, Marco. I think uh, when I first took perspectives, I heard from a missionary from Avant Ministries, or sorry, at that time it was Camino Global. Um, and I know you know some people that served with them. And uh, I love because I'd never knew those cultural language, not only the visual, but cultural and language similarities that just made that so strategic. It's so hard for uh, gringos like me sometimes to get into those countries, but there are so many opportunities there strategically. So uh, I love that. And I also love one of the things you mentioned about even national mission trips. Um, I, I liked when you were talking about going to a city outside of your own. Yes, we should love and serve the city that, that God has placed us in, but you, you brought out something really important, that idea that when you're in another city, if you're in your home city, you're distracted by all the things that happen in that city. Um, if, you, if you step away from the city, if you go to the East Coast or to the West Coast or Northwest or whatever, it's a little bit hard for people to pull you away. You're a little bit more immersed into the team dynamics, also the service and that kind of thing. So I, I really enjoyed you kind of speaking to that, that kind of 
strategic focus. David, and can I can I say this? Uh, the 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 purpose of the shore mission trips is not to fix the thing, right? Because in in one week you're not gonna do too much. Right. I mean, you got to be in long term. But the the purpose of the shore mission trips is just to go and taste just to be there, just to know the local missionaries, they, how they struggle. So you can come back to your church and to be more strategic, right? You could be sending people in the long term. There's a lot of people that went to a shore mission trip and then uh, the Lord calls them to go on a long term. Or you're going to be sending more resources because you know the need. So yeah. it's, it's a place for the shore mission trips. It's not going to fix the thing. But it's gonna give you the the eyes, and you're gonna be there to feel the need, right? Yeah, I love that. I love that. So we've got a bunch of questions we're not gonna to get to today. Sorry, folks. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send all of these questions with your email addresses to Marco, uh, and time permitting, I'll let him reach out to you if he's able to connect or if he's able to help you with some resources. But I want to end on this question. I think this is a good one to wrap us up on. Uh, Blake asks what u.s sending agencies are doing the best job of mobilizing hispanics for international missionary service uh, i'm a southern baptist and obviously i'm going to say the imb is doing a good job uh imb is doing is, is sending more latinos they are doing they're doing it pretty good the problem with that is it's pretty limited right you got to be southern baptist you got to have some kind of education you have to be in some kind of level uh, as far as I know, uh, could be another agency. It's like Avant. Avant is, is doing a good job. It's a great job. Camino Global. I mean, former Camino Global. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Glo Camino Global joined to Avant. They're doing some uh, great job. David Reese was uh, with 1615 a month ago, probably. So that that's that's the answer. That's your answer. IMB is doing a great job something like Avant is, is doing another good job that as far as I know. Yeah, I mean, Avant is obviously, we've been partnering with Avant for over 20 years uh, and we love David. Not only did he do a webinar with us in this series, but he also came to our mobilized church workshop uh, in Kansas City uh, and really loved it. I will tell you, for those of you that are on, on the call still and, and watching later on YouTube, we're in the process of translating our books and our materials into Spanish. It has been highly requested. We are in the process of working on finding the right translators and getting all those things into play. Uh, we are kind of moving into the fundraising port part portion of the translation project. So if you've been a fan of When Everything is Missions and you feel like that would be a resource to Spanish speaking churches, not only here, but globally, uh, we would love for you to reach out to us if you'd want to partner with us on that, as well as the Mobilized Church. Uh, David Ruiz works with a network of like 60 countries, and he believes that the Mobilized Church is one of the most needed assets in um, Central and South America, which is a huge blessing to us. Uh, and we're thankful that we can serve the global church that way. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, Marco, again, brother, so good to see you. Uh, it's been too long. We live too close together. We got to grab lunch sometime. Um, but thank you so much for coming and sharing just your experience uh, with us today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, David. Right? Let's grab some lunch. Yeah. yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, hey, everybody, we're going to sign off here and we will see you next month. We're going to be joined by Africa Inland Mission talking about strategic access to closed countries or are they really closed? So hopefully we'll see you then. Uh, you guys have a great day.